It needs an interdisciplinary team all working together. A physician, someone working on vision, someone working on vestibular, someone working in the neck, someone working on return to school or work, return to play, and someone on the neuropsychology role. And when you have all of these pieces working together, you don't see concussion as just one black box. You break it down into which aspects each individual has. And then you really need to treat each of these aspects individually with a plan. That's Dr. Shannon Bauman, one of North America's leading concussion experts. She's our guest on this episode of Concussion Central, the podcast that changes the way you get your information about concussions. Hi there, and welcome to Concussion Central. I'm your host, David McGuffin. Our aim on this podcast is to help you, the listener, navigate the often very confusing world of concussions, diagnosis, and treatment. And we understand that for those living with a concussion, the best way to receive information isn't reading material, it isn't online, and it's definitely not on a screen. It's by listening. We hear you. So on this podcast, we'll be bringing you regular audio interviews with some of the world's leading experts on the many aspects of concussions. And I'm really thrilled with the expert we have lined up for you today. I'll let her introduce herself. I'm Dr. Shannon Bauman. I am a primary care sports medicine physician. I've been in practice for 15 years, caring for athletes and individuals um, from recreational sport to professional sports teams. I've also, for the last six to eight years, have been involved in specializing in sports-related concussions and concussion work. I started a clinic called Concussion North, which is a physician-led interdisciplinary clinic in Barrie, Ontario. And through this clinic, we saw individuals from all across the country with sports-related concussions. And as a team, we managed all aspects of their recovery from start to finish. One of the reasons we're thrilled to have you on the podcast is because you are clearly one of the leading concussion experts, uh, particularly in sports concussion experts in North America. But also what fascinated me me too about your history is that when you began into your practice, you yourself suffered a pretty debilitating concussion early on. And I just want to know, A, can you tell me how did that happen? Certainly. Really, my own concussion and the experience I had was what has driven me to do concussion work. I've been a sports medicine physician for 15 years, but I wasn't always specializing in concussion. Like many sports medicine physicians, my practice was whatever came into clinic or sideline management when we worked with professional Mm -hmm. teams. So you may see a concussion in a very, at the time it happens situation or acute situation as we call it. However, the part that was always a black box or unknown to me and has always been a challenge for myself and many clinicians is what happens when those concussions don't get better? It's the ones that are weeks and months or years later Mm -hmm. that we often didn't feel prepared to manage and Mm -hmm. our guidelines at the time were not um, really giving us a lot of direction on how Mm -hmm. to do this. So my personal experience really is what changed things for Mm -hmm me. So as you alluded, yeah, I was playing hockey, um, really in a co-ed drill type setting. It wasn't a game, it was a practice. And there was a drill we were doing where we were supposed to fully accelerate, go and pick up a puck and switch directions. I fully accelerated and so did the other player. (laughs) However, we completely had a mid-ice collision, um, both of us going full speed towards each other. Um, I ended up hitting him at the chest level with my head being thrusted back. Then I fell back to the ice, landed on my tailbone. I was able to get back up. I kind of sat there stunned. But the first thing I noticed was really loud alarm that had been pulled, but it sounded so loud. I couldn't even focus and concentrate. And then very quickly, I started getting disoriented. I Mm -hmm. felt like the lights were bright. I felt really dizzy. I didn't feel like I could really think through what was happening. I was, you know, left the ice. I started walking into the dressing room and I was barely able to figure out how to take my equipment off. Wow! It was at that time that I asked one of my teammates and I said, I can't drive home from practice. I'm going to need someone to drive me. So I had a ride home. 
I went to bed thinking, I'm sure I'll be fine tomorrow. Maybe I'll have a little headache, but I had never had a concussion before. Mm -hmm. I really thought, you know what, I'm sure I'll feel better after a good night's sleep. Right. The challenge was I went to clinic the next day to try to see patients. Wow. <laughs> and yeah. very quickly I realized my vision was off. I was dizzy. I started getting really nauseated and I needed to go, go home. So what I thought was going to be days <laughs> turned into weeks, right. which turned into months, which ended up turning into a full two years away from my medical practice, difficulty coping in my daily life difficulty coping in social situations, right. um, everything that I had learned about concussions, I tried to apply. And it really at that time was the idea of it's just rest. If you mm -hmm. rest long enough, you'll get better. And right. I heard that message from many professionals, many of my colleagues who are like, you know, as well as anyone, Shannon, it's just rest. It's just time. Right. So I did what I to was told. I sat on my couch even the lights from my mini blinds in my windows were too bright. I couldn't even sit in my own house without having terrible headaches and migraines and feeling dizzy. So I basically walked around the house with dark sunglasses and a baseball cap. I didn't move far from my couch. I just stared straight ahead out the window. Wow. And that really was months of my life. I had difficulty sleeping. I tried to go to sleep and I had insomnia um, I really was crushed with headaches. I couldn't read. I couldn't listen to the radio. Mm -hmm. Just any of those kind of things um, made it that I couldn't tolerate it. I couldn't tolerate phone calls. Mm -hmm. People, I just couldn't focus. Mm -hmm. And I meanwhile, I had a four-year-old daughter that oh, I was wow. trying to look after. And um, I wasn't able to work. And I ended up being on disability for two full years. And during that time, it really was me thinking, there's got to be another way to manage this concussion besides sitting here, feeling like it's just time and wondering what day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to all of a sudden magically feel better or start to feel better. Right. So months and months into this and still the only advice you're getting is just ride it out, basically. Pretty much. And I mean, I was kind of direct. I, I was trying to be proactive. And mm -hmm. I made some appointments for myself with other individuals. So I went to see uh, a, p a physio that was working on my neck. Um, I had a physio colleague who started doing some vas early vestibular work with me. Mm -hmm. um, what does that involve? So that was kind of doing some eye movements, trying to re-get my eyes to go side to side, up and down, move my head, a lot of that was so bothersome for me, I could barely even mm. track an image. So I wasn't able to do a lot with that therapy yet. Um, I ended up seeing five different optometrists. I thought there was something going on with my eyes. And like many patients can probably share with you, I went to appointments and was told there's nothing wrong with your eyes. Your mm. eyes are completely normal. But I kept saying, I can't read. I can't, every time I look at this image, it's going in and out of focus. It's giving me bad headaches. I can't comprehend what I'm reading. I would try to read two words on my phone and I couldn't even repeat what was actually on my screen. So I knew there was something going on, but I kept getting the response that there wasn't anything that was abnormal. So what was the moment, you mentioned you're two years on disability, and but clearly you've come out of it. What was the turning point for you? I really think, to be honest, for me, the and I kind of say this to patients, is there's a missing puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. And until you find that missing puzzle piece, it's going to be different for each person or a combination of puzzle pieces. The two big things for me that I hadn't yet really treated was really what I needed to get better. And that was my migraines and my vision piece. So I ended up seeing a migraine neurologist who worked with me and said to me, Shannon, if you have a headache every single day, 30 days a month, why do you not think this is a migraine? And I said, well, because it happened playing hockey. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I am someone who has a history of migraines, not often, but a few times a year. I'm like, this isn't the same feeling. This isn't the same headache. And she said, you know what, even if it doesn't feel the same, the fact that you have a headache every single day means we need to treat this. So I was put on some medications for migraine. 
And that was about a month in was the first time in probably about six or eight months that I actually started sleeping. I started sleeping, the headaches started going down. And that was really the first turning point for me. Mm-hmm. Once I started sleeping, I started feeling better and the headaches were getting better. The challenge was still my eyes. And I ended up um, seeing a neurooptometrist that specialized in pediatric developmental binocular vision issues. It was more of, I heard her commercial on uh, the radio and I'm like, I've already tried five people. Why not one more? And it turned out her experience in working with pediatric vision Mm -hmm. and how the eyes team together and how the eyes work on processing was really where some of my issues were. So in working with her, she identified one of my eyes was seeing about 30 centimeters different than where the other eye was focusing. So my eyes completely weren't able to focus or see things clearly when both of my eyes were (laughs) trying to read. As soon as we corrected that, so I had a corrective lens in one eye (laughs) to balance that out. Mm -hmm. As soon as we were able to correct that, um, we were also able to correct a few other vision issues that I was having my headaches started going away. I started being able to feel better. And some of these things, um, I could then get back to Mm -hmm. having more success working on treating my neck, treating the vestibular system. How far in is this into the, this was probably about a year in. Mm -hmm. Um, I also, the second thing I started doing as I was feeling a bit better was spending some time researching other concussion programs and what other people across the world were doing with concussions, because I felt that, you know, it was shortly after the time Sidney Crosby very publicly had his concussion, and the world knew about Sidney Crosby's concussion and how he was being managed by University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So my moment was, I need to figure out what they're doing at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center (laughs) and what we're not doing here, and what am I missing? Mm -hmm. So what I started doing was reaching out to the physicians involved in the UPMC program and just getting a sense of what they were doing and how they were approaching things. Mm -hmm. And they had invited me to come to Pittsburgh and see the clinic and see how they were managing concussions. Mm -hmm. So more as an observer, not as a patient, I went to see firsthand what kind of approach they had to it. Yeah. And it was really based on this experience of it needs an interdisciplinary team all working together. It Mm -hmm. needs a physician, um, someone working on vision, someone working on vestibular, someone working in the neck, someone working on return to school or work, someone doing the return to play, and someone on the, you know, the neuropsychology role. And when you have all of these pieces working together, you don't see concussion as just one black box or one entity called concussion. You break it down into which aspects each individual mm-hmm. has, such as headache, sleep, vision, vestibular, neck, you know, intolerance to cognitive activities or sport. And then you really need to treat each of these aspects individually with a plan but they all need to work together. Mm-hmm. We need to prioritize which systems need to be treated first to get these all to come around. And that's really that type of idea for me was, okay, what other missing pieces do I have? What's mm-hmm. the treatment I need to start doing for some of these other aspects? So one by one, I sought out different individuals in the medical and healthcare community that could help me with each one of these. Mm -hmm. So I made my own team. But what I realized was it's very hard for anyone to know who in the system has this expertise. Who do you need to see and why and when? So it comes down to kind of a really well said quote by Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation is the right care at the right time by the right provider. Mm -hmm. And my idea when I was getting better was creating a clinic where each patient was seen by a physician who could identify each of these individual features for each person and really setting them up with a team so they know exactly who they need to see, Mm 
mm-hmm. and get them right to the right person at the yeah. right time. Yeah. That idea of a team too, it sounds like the exact opposite of what you were going through beforehand too. I mean, it sounds like you were individually finding people to treat you and they weren't necessarily talking to each other at all, I'm sure. Yeah. And like many patients can probably um, sympathize with, it costs a lot of money. Mm. A lot of these treatments are not OHIP funded treatments. So every time you get another opinion or you go see another individual, you're really investing potentially out of pocket. Is this treatment going to work? And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I spent probably thousands to tens of thousands of dollars trying to find the right care. And the other reason when I started my clinic was really important to me is I want people to get to the right person rather than needing five different opinions to get to the right person. And, and that's some of the things we found in our Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation provincial standard document was many people with concussion and brain injuries see at least six to 10 different individuals before they stumble upon the person who has the experience to help them. And that's a challenge. That's a costly stat because these things that they're trying Not only does it delay their recovery, but it also costs money each time you're trying to get to the right person. And it might be what's keeping them from getting back to school or sport and keeping them in this. Mm -hmm. But how does the right, how does the person know who the right person is to see? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of one of the problems I was trying to address, you know, with our clinic is how do we get people to the right person? Mm -hmm. I should just say we've uh, Oakley the Cavapoo is also a guest on the podcast today. So if you hear some growling, that's Oakley. <laughs> she wants my attention. <laughs> <laughs> so could, just take us through then the final steps. You say it took two years. So having figured out your team and, and working on that University of Pittsburgh principle, I mean, what were the final steps for you to be able to get yourself back to work and reclaiming your life? I think it was just really going slow and slowly re-adding back in small aspects of my practice and knowing that I was going to still have some symptoms, but the idea of if you keep doing the same amount of um, that task, it's going to keep producing less symptoms over time. Mm -hmm. So I would start with one patient and I did, I found it hard. I would get some headaches. I'd have a hard time focusing and concentrating. But after I did that a few times, that one patient got easier Mm -hmm. (laughs) Then I could add in two patients. And so then I added in a half day pretty, pretty soon. Then I was back doing, you know, a half day to a full day. I felt I'm ready to take on a new adventure and start a concussion clinic. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of my goal after my recovery to put in place the first version of Concussion North. Mm -hmm. And I had to believe that I was able to, you know, have that full recovery to be able to take, take that on. So I felt that after about six months, I was really ready to start building the clinic and really start taking on more patients who had concussions Mm -hmm. and work together with them and create a small team Mm -hmm. and start to see how this model was going to work. Yeah. And with that concussion, I mean, you'd obviously drifted into what's considered long-term concussion. You're into mm-hmm. a couple of years. Were people surprised that you were able to turn it around? I, I think people were surprised. I think there's kind of that common historical viewpoint that mm-hmm. if you're not better by two years, you're not going to get better. And I don't know exactly where that originated from, but it was pervasive across mm-hmm. not just the medical field, but the insurance industry, the lawyers. It was kind of this, if you are still having concussion symptoms at two years, there's not a big chance that you're going to get better. Mm-hmm. So I think hitting the two-year mark was really this big milestone from a disability insurance point right. and from a medical um, point where as I was hitting that mark, there wasn't a lot of confidence that I was going to make a full yeah. recovery. Yeah. And I think being the athlete by background, I was determined that that uh, wasn't going to apply yeah. to me, that I was going to get better. And no matter what, I was going to make a full recovery. Right. And it wasn't even in my vocabulary that I wasn't. So, yeah. you know, in talking to my disability insurer insurance and saying, hey, you know what? 
I don't need to be on disability anymore. I've been able, you know, I feel confident that I'm going to be able to go back and do some things. And, and it was quite shocking to them in the response. I was shocked by their response. Um, they really were like, really? <laughs> People don't get better after two years. I'm like, well, no, they do. And they do leave disability. And that this is me. I'm going back to work. And, you know, I think that was very surprising to my caseworker. I think people in the field were surprised I came back. And not only did I come back, but I actually ended up coming back with a whole new practice, a whole new focus and a whole new perspective. It was really kind of my passion for the experience that I went through and said, yeah, I've been through this now. And this is something that I have something to offer to other people. And I feel very motivated that that's kind of my calling of what I need to do. So I was, I was very motivated to try to figure out how to create a physician-led interdisciplinary clinic mm -hmm. and put that into our Canadian healthcare system when no one had done that before. And there wasn't a blueprint and there also wasn't the support for it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really fit into our healthcare model. So I had to be very creative of how do we how do we create this and how do we do this? Because I felt that it was a need that we didn't have clinics doing this yet. Mm -hmm. So that was, I was very motivated to, to make this work. To what extent do we have clinics doing that now? There's very few, hmm. David, there's really, there's becoming a little bit more now because I think our guidelines um, have started to support the need for an interdisciplinary team. To find them all under one roof is fairly rare rather than the norm. You might find one solo physician doing concussions or one physio that has experience in concussions, one optometrist or neurooptometrist that does concussions. But to have everyone working together is really unique. Um, we were the first clinic of our kind mm -hmm. to do this. There's one other clinic that started at the same time we did in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I think under Dr. Mike Ellis, his clinic and our clinic were really the only two in the country at the time doing this and doing an interdisciplinary physician-led model. The need was huge, and it wasn't something that we had support at the provincial level yet. We don't have physician billing codes to see concussions. We don't have interdisciplinary care model support or funding, I really felt strongly that the funding needs to come from government to create these models, just like you'd have a stroke center or a cancer center. You really need an interdisciplinary team in these kind of complex conditions. Concussion is no different. Mm -hmm. And I was really hoping that this would be a government initiative to create the funding and support for a physician-led interdisciplinary team. But without funding and support, people have had to do it privately. So what you're left with is privately funded clinics and where do you get the private funding? It has to either be a donation mm -hmm. <laughs> from someone who feels strongly about this or you do it yourself and try to figure out a way to make it work in our system. And that's the route I needed to go, but I was hoping if I put in the funding, created this, that the government would really say, hey, this is important. I see the work mm -hmm. you're doing. I've seen the statistics of your program, why it's successful. We need to get behind this. But unfortunately, the funding never came. For someone who is experiencing a concussion or has experienced a concussion now in Canada, I mean, what, what steps or recommendations would you have for them? I think the first and foremost recommendation is you really need to be evaluated by a physician. Now, depending on the severity of how that injury happens, if it's in an emergency situation, that physician first point might be the emergency room. Rule out a brain bleed, rule out a spinal fracture, you know, depending on that kind of severity. If it's something that happens with um, and you have the ability within kind of 24, 48, 72 hours to see your family physician, that would be the first person, the first physician that that patient might see. If you are seen in the emergency room, you still need to follow up with your primary care physician. 
because I often say emergency doctors, their role is really to make sure you don't have a brain bleed or a fracture. Even if they see you right at the beginning, you may develop symptoms of a concussion later. So I can't 100% rule out that you don't have a concussion at that first emergency visit. You really do need a detailed medical assessment done in an office setting that can spend the time a couple days later in follow-up to really look to see, are there any signs of concussion that are presented? I think that first point with a primary care is really important. A lot of concussions in what we've seen is 70, 80% can be managed by a family physician. All of these concussions aren't going to become persistent that need specialty care. Mm -hmm. But the role of the family physician also is to identify, are there certain features that this person's presenting with that might lead to a risk of a prolonged recovery? And if they are, how do we get them to the right person right away? So if they start to say, you know what, this isn't, this isn't one that's going to resolve within a week to two. Mm-hmm. This is going to need some aspects. Either it's a high-level athlete or someone's got severe visual issues or they're really strug- struggling cognitively or with migraines. They may say, you know what, I really need them to get to someone who has more experience to manage this. And that's going to be better for the patient too because they need to be looked after in a little bit different way. So many patients can be followed by their primary care, but some might be identified to see a specialist sooner. And if you do, who is that physician who has experience in concussion care? Many physicians who have experience might either be under sports medicine, so they might be under a primary care sports medicine doctor like myself. There's there's quite a few in the field that manage concussions. Um, it might be a neurologist, but I find there's less neurologists managing concussions. So it could be physical medicine rehabilitation, which is another specialty, or it could be pediatrics. So with kind of in those physician specialties is usually where you might find someone who has experience in concussion care. So you really are relying on your primary care to try to connect you Mm -hmm. with that person in the system. And then once you get connected to that specialist, really they're going to, they're going to take your kind of care from there. And if you need other rehabilitation things, if you need a referral to neurooptometry or to physio or to an OT or an AT, they're going to help facilitate that for you and follow you through till, till really clearance. Fantastic. Well, Shannon Bauman, thank you so much for coming on the Concussion Central podcast. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode of Concussion Central. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, please give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us reach a much bigger audience. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. For more information on the work of Concussion Central, you can visit our website at concussioncentral.ca. So until next time, I'm David McGuff.